All right. I know they told me to stay in this little box, but I want to walk among you. How are you guys doing this morning? Are you awake? Awake? Are you? Right? I prove it. Stand up. <laughs> up, 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 everybody up. Not just the Hack in the Box crew who weirdly listen to me. I don't, I don't understand why this happens every year. Um, so, okay, I make you get up because I have to be up. And my God, I drank too much last night. So if I have to be up, you have to be up for just two minutes. So besides the Hack in the Box crew who have seen me do this to the audience before, um, how many of you have been in the security industry for, or security industry or computing industry for five years or less? Okay, so sit down. Those are five years or less, sit down. Okay, 10 years or less, sit down. Okay, now we're seeing how old I am. I'm still standing. 15 years or less, okay. All right, wait, wait, we're dwindling here. So who is left standing up? Okay, number one, these are people you need to buy drinks for because we have been through a lot. <laughs> okay, yes, you, you can all sit down at this point. Um, so thank you so much for having me again at Hack in the Box. Um, you know, uh, the crew here, we were talking about it, the other uh, keynotes and I, were talking about how much this conference, you know, takes care of you, and the crew takes care of you. And today, I'm actually going to talk about, uh, essentially, a massive, long-held social engineering hack that probably started for me about 18 years ago. Well, my first DEF CON was DEF CON 7. So, yes, uh, you need to buy me all the drinks because I'm very old, and uh, clearly I need those drinks to live because, you know, Water isn't doing it for me. But um, no, for me, uh, hacking has been a passion for quite some time. And you know, my, my career started so long ago in this industry that there weren't a lot of ways to make money, um, legitimately, or otherwise, actually, because the early internet didn't have the same dependence that the current internet uh, has for us as a society. You know, we didn't do any banking online back when I was learning how to hack, right? We didn't do a whole lot of things that our society depended on economically, uh, socially, and politically. Let's not even go there right now. I'm so depressed uh, in the United States. But the point was, if you knew how to hack a computer, back in the days that I learned how to hack a computer, there were things that you could do with it that were mostly curiosity bound. And how many of you saw Aaron's talk yesterday morning? Raise your hands. Yeah. So Aaron did this great, see this is who wakes up in the morning. This, you guys are hardcore. Um, but, you know, uh, in terms of hacking and what you could do with it, Aaron did this great walkthrough, you know, that was inspired by Hollywood and essentially showing how life was imitating art in terms of hacking. But way back, there really wasn't that much you could do commercially in order to make money if you were a hacker. Um, certainly the, the movie War Games, you know, which started the, um, uh, the Reagan administration in the United States on this path of criminalizing hacking uh, because they were afraid of our superpowers, they were afraid of what we could do. Um, certainly that was, was a big moment in hacking history. However, it was a moment in which our activities were criminalized, not celebrated, not understood, and ways in which that we might have been able to contribute to the security of our society were overlooked in, in favor of fear. And I see this today um, in terms of legislation and regu uh, regulation that is being put in place or is already in place in terms of trying to deal with our superpowers, um, what they perceive, the normal people in the world perceive as magic of what we can do. So one of the things that I noticed during my first DEF CON, uh, they keep telling me not to move across this space, but obviously I just, I can't stand it. I really want to be with you. <laughs> so how many of you had a computer when you were a child, right? Okay, so there's a generational issue here too as well. How many of you had an old computer that could only do command line when you were a child? Okay, there we go. So the thing, <laughs> The thing about it is, is uh, 
if that's how you had to learn how to use a computer, and that's how you had to learn how to use the internet, um, there were a lot of things that you had to do manually that weren't set up for you. And so when we were learning how to do this, we essentially had to either learn very quickly how these things worked or write something ourselves that made the computer do what we wanted it to do um, in order to get what we wanted. Um, a lot of us got our start in security because we had a younger brother or sister that we simply wanted to keep out of our files. So that was our first you know, attempt at encryption. Others of us got into it because we wanted to play a game that we didn't have a license for. And so learning how to use a hex editor to crack you know, a, a, um, a game. But eventually, the stakes became much higher for all of us as our dependence as a society grew on computing, on the internet itself, and on the ability of people like the folks in this room to change the rules at any given time of what was possible with a computer, with a network, and at this point in our, in our technological growth, with anything at all that might have code running on it and might be on the internet. They call it the internet of things. I feel like that's gonna be a term that goes away very quickly because that is going to just define the internet. Just because every single thing that you, are, that you could have, that you want to collect data, is going to be talking to every other thing. And when I look at all of the interconnected devices, our dependence on it societally, our dependence on it economically, and the fact of the matter is that our society, even if you want to opt out of this new interconnected world, let's say you want to drive a car with not a single microchip in it for the rest of your life, that's lovely, but you will be sharing the road with vehicles that have been designed to drive themselves. And so your safety and, and the safety of the people that you care about will be somewhat dependent on, dear God, the security of a vehicle that may or may not have been designed to be a computer as well. And we all know how fragile this ecosystem is, especially the old folks that you need to buy drinks for. We all very much, yes, see, he's, he needs a drink right now. You just help him out. Um, but we understand the fragility of this ecosystem. And quite frankly, it frightens the heck out of me that not only is our society dependent on it now, but there will be no aspect of society where you can opt out anymore. Um, and you cannot opt out of the internet, and you can't opt out of security. So. The, the title of this talk is actually Hacking the Pentagon. How many of you heard about Hack the Pentagon? Okay, the crew and my friends in the front row, put your hands down and anyone left. Okay, oh, one, two, two people who are not crew or my friends in the front row have heard of Hack the Pentagon. So just to give a little bit of background, um, I obviously I was, I was a tinkerer, a hacker for a very long time in my life, but at a certain point, in my career, I decided that I needed to do some hacking that was a little bit higher level in terms of how much I could affect the world. I certainly could find bugs, and I certainly could you know, make my penetration testing clients satisfied because I was able to break into their network or, or do all of that stuff. But I realized at a certain point, especially considering I was finding the same types of bugs over and over again, that one, it was getting boring, two, we weren't getting better at security necessarily, and, and three, that I might not be able to affect change and help society as much as I wanted to if I was essentially hacking one bug at a time, one client at a time. So remember I said that, that my first DEF CON was DEF CON 7. That was in 1999. Um, and we were all kind of rolling up and waiting for the Y2K bug. Has anyone heard of the Y2K bug? <laughs> Okay, all right, again, besides the front row and the crew, who is left in the room? Okay, so we were concerned about this glitch that was going to affect so many computer systems worldwide, um, and they had a shortage of programmers who could program, you know, in a lot of the, the languages, COBOL, for example, that, that were running a lot of this vulnerable code, and we were worried that essentially 
the grid, as it were, way back then, was just going to come crashing down. You know, we were worried airplanes were going to fall from the sky, all kinds of things. Hardly any of that happened. There were a few little incidents that were related to Y2K, but think about the computing and interconnectivity that was around in 1999 versus where we are today in 2016. And you begin to see this picture of that was viewed as a potential disaster on the horizon because of one bug distributed across multiple systems around the world. And you see the growth of the internet, and I would love to have stats off the top of my head, but let's just say it's grown exponentially. Our dependence on it has grown exponentially. Today, we have so many interconnected devices with often no way to update them. It's not a matter of finding someone who can write the code and correct the one bug, but, you know, uh, Crew in front row, you're allowed to raise your hands for this. Heartbleed, anybody? Yes, you've heard of this. Okay, so Heartbleed is such a great example of where we are now in terms of our state of overall vulnerability and inability to deal with the issues at hand. Shared library, open source, bug in the code for more than two years. A couple of people managed to concurrently find that bug. So proving that you know, if one person found it, probably somebody else did as well, that old theory um, or of bug collisions. But think about what the rollout looked like for dealing with that. One, vulnerability coordination at best between one hacker or one finder and one vendor is rough sometimes. Imagine vulnerability coordination between hackers vendors of an open source library, and then the fact that the library itself has to be distributed across the world. That distribution and that vulnerability coordination took over a hundred different companies, all trying to keep a secret that ultimately leaked about a week before the designated date where everybody was supposed to go live with it. So thinking about the problems with vulnerability coordination, even on a scale like that, where it's just trying to deploy a fix for one shared library. And you look at the world of Internet of Things and how many of those things have full software development houses in, at their disposal, have full testing houses, have automation and testing, have any kind of security development lifecycle, you pretty much come down to almost no one. And then of those IoT vendors, how many of the, them are using open source libraries? You come up with most of them. And it's a shortcut way for a lot of these uh, technology organizations or these non-technology organizations who are suddenly adding code to their, to their devices and systems to ramp up very quickly and develop something that can suddenly talk to the internet when they don't even know what they're doing. And they have no way to essentially service or patch all of these devices. So let's get back to hacking the Pentagon, right? So hacking the Pentagon, one, I'm amazed that they kept that name, Hack the Pentagon. That was, that was a surprise to probably all of us um, who were working on this project for the last couple of years. Um, we would call it that. But what it was, was symbolically and effectively the very first time that the United States government, one, admitted that it needed some help in terms of cybersecurity, not just saying, no, no, we're secure, trust us, it's fine. All of your personal data, you know, everyone who's ever applied for a clearance, it's fine, we're, we'll take care of it. One, it was the first time they were openly asking for help from the hacker community. Two, it was the first time that they wanted to do anything with the hackers publicly except throw them in jail. Um, and three, it was the first time that the United States government was willing to pay people like us for, uh, in exchange for vulnerabilities. And you might think that this was some kind of an impossible task. And it was, for sure, definitely. The people inside the Pentagon who helped make this happen, um, who were the internal bureaucratic hackers, um, Lisa Wiswell, Charlie, uh, Chris Lynch, all of those folks, and Secretary of Defense Ash Carter himself, who made the decision ultimately to go ahead and do this crazy thing and prove the fact that not only could the government work with hackers directly, but they could work with hackers and invite them to hack the actual Pentagon and survive and get better. 
Um, that program lasted for about 21 days. It was a pilot program. The Department of Defense has publicly announced already that they're going to expand that program because what they found was over 1,400 hackers tried to pre-register for this program. Uh, a lot of people were thinking that this was not going to work, that, that you know, a lot of my hacker friends, actually, are still to this day very suspicious about the whole thing, thinking that they were going to be registered in this giant government database, they were going to end up in Guantanamo, you know, that essentially all the paranoia was there, and yet 1,400 different hackers came forward and wanted to participate in this historic program and, you know, have all their names written down and their social security numbers known and all that stuff. But the fact of the matter was, the United States government wasn't just looking for its bugs. It was looking for people who were willing to help, people who would actually answer the call when they said, we actually need your help. Hackers, we need your help. So of those 1,400, uh, within, I believe it was 13 minutes after the doors opened on Hack the Pentagon that the first vulnerability report was received. 1,400 people and already, less than 15 minutes into the program, bugs started coming in. So, looking back at what the Pentagon's goals were, engage the hacker community, find out about vulnerabilities in some of its websites, and figure out who is willing to come forward and trust the fact that they would actually come forward when called to hack the Pentagon and they would actually turn over the bugs they found. All of these things had to be met in order for that program to be deemed a success and deemed a way to move forward in a new way with the hacker community um, rather than putting them in jail or threatening them, but in fact embracing them. And I will not forget the fact that at the end of the program, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter invited a couple of the hackers up to the Pentagon to stand with him as he talked about the results of the program. One of them was a high school kid. And you know, for those of us who have been doing this for a very long time, can you imagine, can you imagine as we were children that the leader of one of the most powerful or potentially the most powerful military organization that the world has ever seen is thanking you for pointing out his weaknesses. Amazing. Um, this was incredible. So how did this even come to be? The first time I went to the Pentagon, I was still working at Microsoft. So for those of you who know how long ago I worked at Microsoft, I left in 2014. I started Microsoft's bug bounties in 2013. That process itself took me about three years to get Microsoft to agree to pay hackers money. But what had happened in order to lead up to the Pentagon and this historic moment where you know, the leader of the most powerful military in the world is thanking a child for pointing out his weaknesses um, began when I had actually briefed some of the folks inside of a small group at MIT and Harvard on what I had done to convince Microsoft to allow hackers to hack them and get paid for it. Now, does anybody remember, I think it was, it was back in like 2008 or so, does anyone remember what Microsoft would say when they were asked about whether or not they would pay a bug bounty or pay hackers money in exchange for vulnerabilities? Anyone remember? Okay, no one remembers, that's okay. Microsoft was publicly saying that they would never pay for vulnerabilities. They said that word, they said never. You know, most mega corporations usually will hedge around what they say and they don't use absolutes if they can't, if they can avoid it. And Microsoft was using an absolute, saying never. And why was that? In the Microsoft Re Security Response Center, how many of you saw Sweetie's talk yesterday? Did any of you saw Sweetie, Sweetie's talk? So Sweetie's talk was, uh, I missed it, but I saw the slides. The slides looked great. It's talking about all the mitigation enhancements to the Windows 10 platform and all the ways in which exploitation techniques are becoming harder to execute, um, even if you do find a critical vulnerability on the platform. But going back to 2008, Microsoft executives were saying, they were swearing that they would never pay money. And what was going on? What, what was causing them to believe that they would never have to do that? Well, in the Microsoft Security Response Center, 
They were receiving over 200,000 non-spam email messages per year of friendly hackers who were volunteering for free to tell Microsoft about its weaknesses. So with that data, they were thinking, well, you know, all these friendly hackers who want to see the world being a, a safer place, these friendly hackers are willing to come forward for free. Rule number one, always silence your own phone when you're presenting. OK, there we go. Um, actually, the day I announced the Microsoft bug bounty programs, I was on stage in Bangkok. And uh, I heard a phone ring going off. And it was going off. And I was thinking, wow, somebody really needs to silence that thing. And then I realized it was a Windows phone ring. And then I realized the only person who, whose phone it could possibly be was mine. So I had to go, well, OK, there was maybe one other person in the room whose phone it could possibly be. But I, essentially, my own alarm was going off on stage the day that I was announcing the Microsoft bug bounty programs. Um, and actually, Dylan and Belinda were there with me. It was an amazing day. Um, but so how did I get Microsoft from this position where they were receiving so many bugs for free, where they were receiving tons of critical, uh, critical vulnerabilities for free, even when there was a, you know, a, an exploit and vulnerability market that was alive and well, where all of these bugs were getting bought by other parties? whether they were defensive parties, like the Zero Day Initiative. How many of you have heard of ZDI? OK, great. So Zero Day Initiative and other kinds of vulnerability acquisition programs like it are defense oriented in that they will buy the vulnerability in order to get it fixed. They will buy it. They will give it to the vendor to fix it. They will maybe build a product or an alerting service or something around the fact that they've acquired these unknown vulnerabilities. But that's the defense market for vulnerabilities. The offense market for vulnerabilities is something entirely different. The offense market is buying vulnerabilities and exploits in order to keep them secret, in order to use them for attacks, in order to keep them live and, and you know, viable for as long as possible. So they're not just buying the vulnerability. They're actually buying exclusivity. How many of you heard what happened with Hacking Team? Any of you heard of Hacking Team? OK, great. So Hacking Team was a great example of how the offense market really worked. You saw in the email dumps of Hacking Team that vulnerability or exploit sellers were offering a range of vulnerabilities. And they were offering uh, priceless price breaks if you bought a bundle, you know, uh, bargain, bargain bugs. Um, and they were also offering um, exclusivity of the vulnerability itself by tripling the price. They also had a payout schedule that was very nicely documented saying, you know, if you buy this bug, give me 50% of the money up front and then uh, pay me out 25%, 25% one month later and then the last month later and you don't have to pay if the bug essentially gets patched or, or something else happens to make it less viable for attack. So you begin to see the, the reason why some of the, the prices for vulnerabilities seem so high in the offense market versus the defense market is because, again, they're not paying just for the vulnerability. They're paying for the hacker's silence. They're paying for the ability to use this thing for offense for as long as possible. So let's get back to Microsoft, right? So Microsoft's getting all of these bugs for free. Sounds great. Sounds like a reason to vow never to pay hackers money. However, there was this pesky thing that I had access to, which was vulnerability reporting data inside of Microsoft. And one of the things that was very important to Microsoft was that it had not just this pipeline of free bugs, but it had a pipeline of potential recruits of hackers who it might be able to hire to help make its products more secure. This direct interaction with hackers, potentially for recruiting, was very important to the biggest software company in the world. Famously, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, there was a hacking group in Poland that some of the early folks at Microsoft Security, years before I was ever there, went to go visit because they had found some serious vulnerabilities. They went to go visit them to recruit them. Some of those folks still work at Microsoft to this day, 15 years later, trying to help make those products more secure. So. 
the data that I had was showing that not only, yes, the bugs were still coming in, but more and more of the bugs, the critical bugs in critical software like Internet Explorer were coming in through zero day initiative or other defense market brokers. So what did that actually do? It cut off access that Microsoft had directly to the hackers. This is bad. It also did something that Microsoft didn't like, which was uh, put a time limit on a fix. Yeah, they hate that. Um, so there were two kind of undesirable things that were happening, even though they were getting the bugs, even though somebody else was paying for them, and even though, you know, generally speaking, at least 180 days would pass before anybody dropped the ODA in this, in this little defensive ecosystem, they realized that they wanted to actually change those trends to regain direct access to that hacker community that's capable of finding those bugs, to uh, be able to um, control, you know, essentially uh, the timeline because of who might know about the vulnerability. And the one piece of data that I showed the IE team that ended up knocking over the last of the objections of Microsoft was data. So, IE would go through a public beta period where they would release, you know, a uh, less than stable version of the software in order for the, uh, the, the customers to go ahead and test it in their environments. F Microsoft engineers were fixing as many bugs as they could during this beta period. So what was happening with all these free, you know, free bugs that the hackers were giving Microsoft? How many of them do you think were coming in during the beta period? You would think 40. 50, no, right? Actually, very few. So there was usually very few vulnerabilities coming in. And then when would they come in? There was a giant spike after the final release of IE, the release to manufacturing. So after RTM, huge spike of incoming vulnerabilities. What did that mean? Well, the incentives at that time for these hackers to come forward with free bugs that Microsoft was offering was 10-point Arial font and their name in a bulletin. So that was the only incentive that a hacker had. Now, if a bug is fixed during the beta period, chances are, unless it also affected down-level versions, you weren't going to get your name in a bulletin. So hackers had inadvertently been trained by Microsoft to hold on to their bugs until the worst possible time to tell Microsoft, which is after you're out of the beta period. So I showed the head of IE this big spike at the worst possible time for engineering for him. And I said, look, all we need to do is provide an incentive for these hackers who are going to help us anyway to come forward earlier in the beta period. And we can do this traffic shaping exercise, and we can move this spike of vulnerabilities and give you guys the maximum amount of time to fix it. I didn't get through my little 12-slide presentation to the head of IE. I got to slide two, and he literally said to me, yes, 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 I'm going to make it easy for you. How much? That was literally what he said. And I sat there after uh, two and a half years at that point, two and a half, almost three years, I sat there saying, wait a minute, did that just happen? Did he just, did he just offer to back a truck of money up to the Microsoft Security Response Center and pay for his bugs? And in fact, that is what happened. Because, just because he wanted to align what the, he knew the hacker community was going to do anyway, which is look for bugs. He wanted to align what he knew the friendly hackers were going to do anyway, which is turn them over to Microsoft to get them fixed. He wanted to align all of these activities that were inevitable with his schedule, and he was willing to pay for it. So that was that. And that finally ended Microsoft's longstanding uh, aversion to paying hackers money directly for vulnerabilities. Finally, there was a reason to channel the hackers' eyes, channel their energy, and point them at the product they wanted to find out about, which is the latest product, at the time they wanted to find out about those bugs in a most advantageous way for engineering and then ultimately for the customer, which was the earliest part of the beta period of that product. So something else that I was able to start at that time was not just an individual bug bounty that was time-based deliberately um, and, and orchestrated to move that big spike of traffic. How many of you have heard of the mitigation bypass bounty at Microsoft? It's the $100,000 bounty that's been going for the last three years. Yeah. So at the time, you could go to Pwn2Own 
And that year, you could get $100,000, was the top prize at Pondo in that year, uh, for you know, coming up with an exploit that would bypass all of the, you know, all of the mitigations of any given platform target. And you get $100,000 um, if you did the live exploit uh, at, that, you know, at that moment during the contest. What I was able to convince Microsoft to do was not have a contest once a year, but essentially having an ongoing six-figure bounty that wasn't necessarily for a single exploit, but it was for something more valuable to Microsoft, and that was for a mitigation bypass technique. How many of you have heard of return-oriented programming? OK, how many of you have heard of JIT spray? All right, slightly fewer, but it's OK. These are all representative examples of mitigation bypass techniques. So whether you find a vulnerability and whether you're able to exploit it are two very different things, right? Especially as modern platforms have been made more and more secure. So why would an organization like Microsoft want to learn about mitigation bypass techniques as early as possible? Does anyone have a guess? That's OK. We'll guess, you know what, we'll guess at karaoke later. It'll be more fun. Um, <laughs> you know that's happening tonight. I'm just inviting you all at this moment. Um, so the reason Microsoft needed to know about it as early as possible is because to create new mitigations to combat those exploitation techniques takes not just a patch Tuesday, it takes re-architecture of the platform on some level. And that is something that usually takes an operating system company several iterations to change. And it's not because they're slow and they don't know how to fix it. It's because all the applications that run on top of the platform all have to have time to adapt to the new way that the operating system works. So it's essentially an issue of future thinking engineering to make exploitation harder because of what you've learned about today of how exploitation works on the platform today. These are much longer term fixes and Microsoft essentially needed to know about these new techniques as early as possible to plan how they were gonna deal with it for the next version or maybe even the version after that of the operating system. Now, remember I was talking about those, those different markets and how uh, you know, they often will pay for exclusivity in very high prices. How many of you think that Microsoft was competing directly on price uh, with these markets? Does anyone really think that? Great, you don't think that or you've fallen asleep. Um, perhaps I need to run around you a few more times, okay. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't need to compete directly on price, not for those IE vulnerabilities that were critical. By the way, how many uh, vulnerabilities do you think were collected in that one month bug bounty period at the beginning of the IE 11 beta uh, release? Anyone wanna guess? Four, did someone say four? Yeah, okay. Um, how much money do you think Microsoft would have had to pay to get those four maybe critical vulnerabilities? One million dollars? No, I didn't hear that out there, okay. No, actually, uh, what happened was even though each of those vulnerabilities, there were 18, by the way, vulnerabilities that came in that were valid and what we would call bulletin class, so they were important or critical vulnerabilities. 18 of them came in in one month. About $28,000 total was spent to collect those 18 vulnerabilities. Now why do you think you know, it was possible for Microsoft to get these for such a low price? Well, think about those other markets. When the offense market wants to buy a bug, they want to be able to use it for attacks. Why would they buy a bug during the beta period of software? Why would they spend six figures on an exploitable vulnerability that may evaporate in next week's you know, test a uh, new release of the, of the beta software? So they wouldn't. So essentially there was a gap in the market there. Now going back to the $100,000 uh, mitigation bypass bounty, yes, there was that same price for the Pwn to Own contest that year, but remember, that was just offering $100,000 for a working exploit and it could use one of those existing exploitation techniques like return-oriented programming or jet spray or whatever it was. It didn't need to come up with a brand new technique in order to claim that $100,000 in that once a year contest. So what was Microsoft thinking, you know, in terms of will they have anybody who's willing to come forward with this very, very valuable technique? Again, think about who the adversary is and what their goals are. 
The adversary's goals are to buy these things that will work for as long as possible, but do they need it to leverage a brand new exploitation technique in order for it to be effective or worthwhile for them? No, because the existing exploitation techniques were working, working just fine. So they didn't need to make that additional investment in trying to find these new exploitation techniques. The only party that was going to benefit from acquiring these new techniques was going to be the operating system manufacturer itself. Hence, how I was able to convince Microsoft to not just buy its own bugs in terms of IE, but buy these new exploitation techniques at what was, until Apple's bug bounty, the highest ongoing vendor bug bounty or vendor technique bounty, essentially, um, that had been an unbroken record for the last three years. It was $100,000 ongoing with no time limit and no end. Anyone want to guess what the rate of Microsoft's learning about new exploitation was? How often would they, would they come across a new exploitation technique through other means, either disclosure you know, from research or you know, from attacks in the wild? Does anyone want to guess how often that would happen before that bounty? No one wants to guess. I am going to have to run among you again. OK. But actually, it was about once every three years. And that corresponds with the release of you know, the operating systems at that point, right? The new mitigations would come out. Some security researchers and or some attackers would research the ways that, that Microsoft had tried to harden the platform and make exploitation harder. And then you would, you would become aware of new exploitation techniques once every three years. Does anyone want to guess at how many times the $100,000 mitigation bypass bounty has been paid out in the last three years? Well, it's not once. They've paid out over half a million dollars in this ongoing bounty because the hackers who are capable of thinking their way around the latest mitigations often weren't doing it for the money, necessarily. They might be doing it for the recognition, but they were definitely doing it for what I call the pursuit of intellectual happiness. And they were curious to see if they could defeat these mitigations. And Microsoft was inviting them to go ahead and do so and offering them a six-figure amount and all the publicity they could possibly stand um, for being helpful in this ecosystem. So fast forward, how did this actually factor in to the Pentagon? So I had given a lecture about all of these different mechanisms that I was employing at Microsoft in order to uh, intentionally disrupt some of the dynamics in the vulnerability and exploit market and intentionally bring in some of these bugs at certain times, some of these techniques at a faster rate, and all of these things. And I had given this lecture, and somebody from the Pentagon happened to be in the room. So that was the first time I was invited to the Pentagon. So I gave the same lecture, essentially, to a room full of people in the Pentagon. And one of the things that I noted was, you know, as with any military organization in the modern world, there certainly were people who were in that room who were interested in what I was doing because they were annoyed because it was going to make their offensive job harder. I don't know who they were. I couldn't identify them. But the offense arm of you know the biggest uh, military uh, in the world was in that room, but the defense arm was too. And so the conversations that were started at that point became conversations I was having over the next couple of years, even as I left Microsoft, even as I went to my former startup company that does bug bounties, the conversations accelerated this past fall. And the reason they did was because uh, something called the Digital Defense Service was started inside the Pentagon. Now, if you go into the Pentagon and you find DDS, well, or someone leads you there, they actually have a little uh, plaque under the door that says Rebel Alliance, Star Wars style, right? So you go in and they basically say, welcome to the Rebel Alliance. They've got 
you know, little BB-8, you know, logos on the sides. It's an open seating environment. And they've got hackers and programmers from some of the most uh, interesting technology companies who are doing rotations in this place. And the whole purpose is to accelerate the Department of Defense's uh, acquisition and utilization of modern technology and modern security techniques. So this brand new group that had been created for the purpose of accelerating, uh, you know, DD, or accelerating the Pentagon's adoption of technology much faster than the usual acquisition, um, acquisition uh, time cycles of software. That was the group that ended up spearheading on the inside the creation of Hack the Pentagon. Because essentially they were told, do things better, do things faster, and I believe in my purse is the card of Lisa Wiswell that literally says under her title, and this is an officially issued card from the Pentagon, get shit done. It says it on her card. So how cool is that? They were, they were given the license to try and experiment with technology and try and experiment with some of these proven techniques that were in the software security world for acquiring vulnerability information and interacting with the hacker community. So the time was right. They were ready to essentially launch, you know, their, launch their, rebel, their, their rebel mission. And I remember getting the call from the Pentagon saying, good news, we're gonna go forward with this. And I thought, this is insane, why is this happening? Am I dreaming, I'm asleep? What time zone am I in? I have no idea, how could this even be true? That after all this, they're finally ready to allow hackers to hack them. And so how many of you actually, you know, kind of saw the, the unfolding of, of the actual Hack the Pentagon challenge, the 21 days and everything? A couple of you, yeah. So what that ended up being was, it was a pilot, right, to prove the concept, to oil the gears of the people receiving the vulnerability reports and, and needing to fix the issues on the back end of the Pentagon. It's a 21 day period, and they not only got all of these vulnerabilities, I believe it was 138 vulnerabilities that they paid $70,000 for total. But they also got that precious access directly to the hackers. And Ash Carter inviting that child to come stand beside him at the podium to shake his hand in the secret uh, coin passing ceremony of, of uh, of how they give you challenge coins, you know, in the military is supposed to be silent in person and with a handshake. Um, so if you watch that video, you can see Ash Carter kind of getting the coins and shaking the hands of the people who are on stage with him, including this child. At the end of it, not only did Secretary Carter announce how successful the program was, but he announced that it was going to continue and expand. This experiment that 35 years ago, when the movie War Games you know, was coming out and scaring President Reagan into making hacking a federal crime, from that moment all the way until Secretary Carter is thanking hackers and asking more of them to come forward and help, seems like an impossible thing. But given the fact that a long time ago when I was hacking computers, that moment where I decided that changing the world one bug at a time wasn't gonna be enough. <laughs> Figuring out how these systems worked, how, how the objections of these large organizations worked became my new hacking mission. And essentially, that was what ultimately caused not just Microsoft, not just the Pentagon, but we're seeing more and more of this revolution where huge organizations and governments are realizing not just the need to work with hackers, but that, that it's actually quite advantageous to them to do so, and that they can't possibly meet the challenges of today or tomorrow without us. So they've restarted my timer like five times. What I'm going to do at this moment is give you about, I think maybe two minutes to ask me some questions. If you're shy, we can take the questions out into the, the foyer. But really, I mean, what is this about? 
I told you about how I was able to reverse engineer you know, all of the objections of these large organizations and in fact exploit the mutual benefit of being able to work with hackers directly and in fact pay them money. But what does this have to do with you? How many of you are in organizations that are considering a bug bounty program? None, you will not admit it, okay. How many of you are in organizations that are capable of receiving a bug report from the outside? God, so few. So one thing was interesting. So I mean, just for people who you know, will watch this later, there were about five hands that went up in this room. That does not surprise me. One of the most interesting pieces of data from uh, my former company was they looked at the Forbes top 2000 companies. These are companies that make billions of dollars in revenue. They spend millions of dollars on security. They do all their compliance stuff. 94% of the top 2,000 companies, according to Forbes, 94% had no published way to receive a vulnerability report. They had no email address like Secure at Microsoft. They had no web form. They had no page that on their website that even said, we want to hear from you, hackers. Tell us about our weaknesses. 94%. Only 6% had something at all. Of the Fortune 100 companies, six of them have bug bounty programs. So what does this all mean? This means that the world is not quite ready for bug bounty programs because the world is not quite ready to even hear from you. So what I would say to that, before I actually let you ask me questions, is think about all of the ways in which an organization actually needs to prepare to receive the bountiful blessings from the hacker community, which are bugs, um, and help them understand that essentially there are only three ways to learn about your vulnerabilities. You can hire pen testers or hire really smart people to work for you and find them yourself. Somebody friendly on the outside, like a partner or a customer or a hacker, can tell you about it. Or you can be attacked. Now, of those three methods, logically, why would you ever want to cut off one of them? So with that, I would like to thank Dylan, Belinda, the Hack in the Box crew. I would like to thank all of you for waking up and standing up and, and uh, entertaining me, at least, for the last hour or so. And I would also like to open it up for questions. But at the end of the day, I mean, we are the ones who have created this technological world that we depend on. And we're the only ones who can secure it. So thank you so much. Questions from the floor? Don't be shy. I'm not singing yet. OK, that's not a question you can ask. But I will take requests later. So what time is karaoke? <laughs> Great question. What time is karaoke? Uh, after whatever the party is tonight, there will be karaoke. No, I mean, uh, in all seriousness, um, I know you may be shy and you might have, but nobody wanted to raise their hand when I asked you know, how many of your organizations are thinking about bug bounties and then how many of your organizations can even receive bugs. You probably have a lot of shy questions you want to ask me in the hallway. And that's OK. Um, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. Um, but I want to thank, again, the crew and all of you for waking up and being with me and indulging me this morning. And now remember, who were those folks? Stand up one more time, the last group of people who had been doing computers security for the last 15 years or more. That last group of people, stand up again. Come on. I know. I'm, I'm standing. All right. These folks, give them a hand because and <laughs> buy them drinks because, my god. We've had so many reasons to drink ourselves to death in the last 15 or so years. Please, um, buy, them, buy them water as well. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katie Missouri.